Welcome to what is our first hybrid lecture in the size. We've done quite a few webinars and online Zoom so during the period. It's the first time we've tried to do one as a hybrid lecture, and we're delighted we've got such an important group that's come to give the lecture tonight. It's great to see so many people here in Sackville Street and a very good showing of people watching this online, which is fantastic. And so I say welcome to the Anglo and Mind Society. I'm Richard Stanford, the chairman here, and it's a delight that we've tonight got to welcome a book launch and a lecture all about a civil screen, language and ecology in southern and eastern Arabia. So a, a cast of uh, very eminent people to give us a, a rundown of that, uh, with John Lovett, John Chatty, Shari, if I can get this wrong, my apologies, Shahana Tazabana, Oh, you'll correct that, Gina. Gina, thank you. And Janet Watson, put it right in the end. Um, and I'm not going to go into fine detail about what they're going to talk about, but John's going to introduce everyone far better than I can uh, and go through what we've got will be a fascinating uh, series of uh, rundowns of a, a huge amount of work that's going to be supported by the society. And it's great to see the fruition of a huge amount of labour. So a very warm welcome to you. Uh, and then we'll take some questions at the end. We'll be able to do questions in the room and questions on, online. But a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Welcome to the launch of our book. Language and Ecology in Southern and Eastern Arabia. We're very pleased to welcome both the audience here in the room and our friends and colleagues who are joining us uh, online. And I would also, while I'm here, note um, Janet's book for children, written in Mary. Uh, and there are some sample copies over there. And if anybody is interested in purchasing the book, then please see Janet afterwards. Um, I'll keep the introduction brief so that we can devote as much time as possible to the main talks. Uh, each of the speakers will talk for about 10 minutes, and I'll keep you to time by reminding you. Uh, and then there'll be opportunities for some questions and uh, answers. Anywhere this way. No? Um, yeah, I think you better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if I'm just being old. <laughs> There'll be three presentations. So, Dawn will talk about her work on non participation in conservation, a case from Oman. Dawn is a fellow of the British Academy and emeritus professor in anthropology and forced migration at the University of Oxford. And she spent many years researching imposition of wildlife conservation in the deserts of Oman. And Shahina, who is stuck in, oh, Shahina, you're here, absolutely terrific. Thank you. Shahina is a senior botanist in the World Botanic Garden Q in science. Her research focuses on the floras, vegetation, biogeography, and conservation of the plants in the Middle East. And she's author of the four volumes of Flora of Oman. And she will talk about a botanical and etymological approach to plant names in southern Arabia. And then the third talk will be by Janet, who holds the leadership chair for language of leaves at the University of Leeds. And she's co directed with me at the Center for Endangered Languages, Cultures, and Ecosystems, SALGI, and a fellow of the British Academy. Her research interests lie in modern South Arabian and Yemeni Arabic dialects. And she will talk about names before numbers and wind. We're very grateful to the many people who helped with the book. Uh, special thanks are due to Adina and Asma for organizing the launch this evening, uh, Aaron and Marina for allowing us to include the, the book in their eco linguistic series, Laura of Bloomsbury Publishers for all her help in producing the book, the Arts and Humanities Research Council for funding the network and the Universities of Qatar and Leeds by hosting the workshops. The book was a collaborative effort of people from many different organizations. And 
please read the book to find out all about them. Um, we're very grateful for all their hard work, experience, and insights. Southern Arabia is remarkably diverse in both ecology and language. This is a natural result of its geographical position, diversity of climates, and extremes of weather. To the south and east lies the continent of Africa. To the northeast, the ancient cultures of Persia, and further to, to the east, the Indian subcontinent is part of a prosperous monsoonal trade route. Over millennia, the monsoon was central to exchange goods, knowledge, and language. It flows to the south during the winter and to the north in the summer. Now it's traveled south to Zandavan, and Kilwa, and returned north to the Red Sea, Oman, Persian Gulf, and eastwards to India. This traditional economic and cultural flow has changed hugely in recent years with changes to transport infrastructure. As a result, there has been a massive loss of traditional knowledge and connection with nature. This poem from the, the book illustrates the cultural resonance of the monsoon. I could never love anything but the monsoon that brings the rain clouds and the breeze which pushes them up and over the high mountains. And Janet will be reading a poem uh, in the, at the end of her talk as well. There is not only the steady climatic rhythm of the monsoon, but also dramatic weather extremes, droughts and floods. Destructive cyclones can cause chaos with high winds and torrential rain. And rainstorms from these cyclone, cyclones can, can traverse the mountains into the desert, bringing a pulse of water into the sands. <clears throat> the geographical position at the center of trade routes, coastal plain, high mountains, and desert all give rise to both a diversity of vegetation and languages which our speakers this evening will tell you about. I will now invite Dawn to give her presentation. Thank you, Dawn. I tried, and if not, I'll ask you to do that. I, uh, I'm not sure whether to make it an apology or whether it's something that, that you should be very thankful for. I had eye surgery last week, and it's taken a long time for me to be able to recover, to be able to read relatively small print. I mean, I can read 40 points, 36 points at this point, but I'm not sure I can actually read my notes, which means I'll be addressing you much more directly. I, um, I think we can go to the, the next slide. Let me see if I can. Okay. Um, I want to talk about one of the, um, important tribes, uh, nomadic or pastoral tribes in Oman. Uh, um, and this tribe sits right in the middle of the country, in Dokar and uh, what we call Northern Oman. It's the northernmost uh, uh, linguistic that speaks uh, modern South Arabian language. Uh, Hasis tribe, we speak Hasis. Before I get into too much detail about them, I just want to say a little bit about what in Arabia we talk about the, the Bedou Hadar um, uh, distinction, which has very, very deep roots in, in, uh, in, in historiography. Um, it, it, and within that context, um, there is a, a synergy, a give and take about people who live in the desert, people who live in urban settings of the, the Hadar. But this distinction doesn't quite carry over in terms of the way that Western experts and development individuals um, working with multinationals um, have come to understand the region. So there's, um, I'm going to say, a, a kind of sense that uh, if you are in the desert, if you are Bedou, or that's not a term that I had come across when I first began working uh, in Oman in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, the people in the interior who live in the desert didn't call themselves the Hadal. Over time, the sort of this concept of the Bedou uh, Hadal sort of came in and with it a, a sense that if they were in the desert, if they moved, if they didn't have houses, there was something backward, irrational about them, or they were invisible. And it's that invisibility that I really want to talk to in some detail. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the way in which the multinational um, extractive industry 
dealt with people who lived in this vast expanse of Egyptian houses, an area of about 40,000 square uh, miles, an area about the size of Scotland, sitting right in the middle of the country. Uh, as far as the uh, multinational uh, oil company, uh, Western experts were concerned, this was an empty land. This was terra nullius. They were only interested in what was underneath. It didn't really matter to them what was happening on the surface. And then I say a little bit more about, which is the, you know, the, the crux of my paper, um, but I'm going to call it the way in which conservation, fortress conservation, protective uh, conservation uh, came about, certainly in the late 70s, early 80s, that viewed the whole of the Jibril Houses as Habila Rasa, which just was in plants, some animals, people didn't matter. My sense of ecology included people. So there's a bit of a sting in some of the things I have to say about the oil company. Next slide, please. Um, you've already you know, seen the, uh, this map about Oman. What the area I'm really interested in, and I'll show you a little close up, it's just right here in the middle. Uh, an area of Jibril Houses in particular is a uh, desert rather than semi-arid land. It receives generally something less than 50 um, years, but it's now suffering uh, from what I'm going to call extreme weather, although this has always happened with the periods of uh, violent rain and then flooding, but the water doesn't seep in, it just rushes out to the sea and often hurts some of their, their animals if they're not cooking enough too far away. The, the, the very sparse natural resources of this region do not give rise to conflict between tribes. Most of the conflicts that have emerged in this region have been, as I said before, with the extractive industry and then laterally the conservation industry. Next slide. So we're talking about the, the Harassis, South Arabian speaking group. Uh, I suppose in the 1990s, I would have said there were about 5,000. Uh, but it's, those numbers have probably grown. There are about six, seven thousand, although a small group of them now uh, have taken up residence on the Omani and Marathi border, but their animals remain uh, in the desert and they come and spend all of their holiday time and weekends uh, in Oman. Uh, the Harasis are a refuge tribe. So, although most of the Harasis speak Hasusi, uh, some of them can speak Arabic. Uh, and I call it a refuge tribe because of the way in which voluntary and Involuntary um, expulsion um, is a way of uh, solving conflicts with your neighbors. So it wasn't unusual in the past hundred years, for example, uh, of a, a lineage of the Mahra falling out with their neighbors, attached to the Harasis, same with some of the Geneva and, and other groups. So the different lineages of the, the Harasis tribe, most of them are Sufi speakers. But some of those, uh, some of the lineage uh, do know Arabic. Although when I first began working with them, women did not know Arabic. Only the men did because of their contact with the oil company. Uh, and um, now over time, of course, with schooling, uh, they all do speak uh, Arabic as well. Um, they raise camel and goat. Uh, <laughs> and talk about how far it is. Uh, it, it is largely a uh, rock, gravel, plain with some areas of sand and then there are these few fingers of orange sand coming from the Ibn Khali. It's an area which until the uh, early 1960s was a waterless plain. And it's always used to amaze me how did the Harasis manage to live in the waterless plain? Um, and they did that by, by moving uh, off of the, the the actual desert floor uh, in the summer. Um, but this was an area where oil oil extraction, exp uh, sorry, exploration was very important. And in the 60s and early 70s, the oil companies kept on looking for, for oil. And of course, they have to first find water to look for oil. And um, after significant um, negotiations between uh, the tribal leaders and the sultan uh, and the oil company uh, for water for the community living in the desert. Can I go to the next slide? So this is the area I'm talking about, the Jewish Palaces. Um, the water was plain until the 1960s uh, when a well was opened at Haima, Elagias, and this was a which was 
not potable in Yuma. Uh, these were wells opened by oil companies. Um, can you give another trend? Um, this is, of course, an area where the uh, fingers of the empty quarter also uh, emerge. And uh, <laughs> between the dunes, of course, uh, sometimes uh, there's some growls, some rays, which uh, are very much and uh, those for accounts. This area that I've drawn in 1978, the IUCN um, was invited, the, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature was invited to explore an area where the salt could establish an aquatic sanctuary. This decided this would be an area and that the north uh, eastern quadrangle would be the actual initial sanctuary for the oryx. The idea was to try to establish a reintroduction project without fences, without walls, um, where the oryx could roam quite widely. Um, next slide. The reason why that northeastern quadrangle was chosen was because of the winter and summer monsoon, mm -hmm. because the effect of that monsoon was what sometimes is called occult precipitation. It's pretty heavy dew that would come in uh, generally. Um, uh, September time, March time, etc., and that kind of gave gave a greening of the northeastern quadrangle. Um, and so the conservationists um, uh, decided to establish that area. But the, what I want to make is that the people on the ground were never consulted. It was assumed that the people, if they were there, were not significant. Um, first few years, there wasn't a problem until there was a I would say a period of dryness, and the heresies realized that actually what all this meant was that they could not bring their camels and their goats up into the northeast quadrangle when they needed to, because that was set aside for the oryx. Um, I'll just show a couple of slides that I go through showing how these people have changed dramatically. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, next slide. Just pretty quickly. I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, these are the heresies uh, when I first met them in 1978. And the next slide, which you don't see much anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, but of course, by the 1980s, already changes were taking place. And the South said they could use social housing, which for the first decade was only being used to shelter goats. It took a while before um, heresies wanted to live in these kind of uh, constructions, but they're uncomfortable actually. Again. Schools were set up, but unfortunately, only teaching the Arabic curriculum uh, and also uh, not really reflecting what life is like in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is the area where the uh, oryx were uh, introduced. Um, by 1982, there were about 48 oryx that were returned from the, the world herd. Those numbers grew to about um, 400 by 1996. Very successful. Um, but during this period, the, the RCs were, I'm going to say, left out. They, they were uh, hired to, to track and follow the social behavior of the animals. But they were not allowed to use basically 25% of their land. Initially, that didn't make much difference, but the young, Old all the were attached to the oryx, but the young men in particular were disinterested. And when illegal poaching began in used that herd of 400, mm -hmm. um, the young harassed were totally disengaged. They were sort of, um, removed from access to this area. And uh, over time, basically, they have um, remained disinterested, which is a pity because this small herd now is within. A fenced area and actually guarded. But I, I guess I can say next slide, and that, that should be on the last one. Um, this image I wanted to show you because this is not actually a campsite, a permanent campsite today, but this is what we call going back to the farm, the Hazwa, that all these different households have because many of them obviously are living in, um, in shelters, in, in cement shelters uh, uh, for much of the year during the school period. And that's my last slide. So the department are still 
uh, the kind of pejorative attitude to Bedouin or Ahara that comes into development. The fear of loss of their language uh, as Arabic becomes hegemonic because it's not taught in schools. And the challenges to their identity because of oil company notions of this whole desert area being terra nullius, their existence there not being recognized, and also the contestation with animal reintroduction still exists. Thank you very much, John. I hope you were able to find some Q and A after. Can I ask you to come forward, please? So. If you you could you could sit there next next to the slide and then and use this. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you will make this because it's been online. So a little bit uh, of, of a throat uh, problem over here, but it's just from, from the weather outside, it's freezing. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about is that basically the chapter that I've written with you on it in, uh, in the book. <clears throat> it is all about plants. I'm treating the actual uh, names of plants over here. Now, <clears throat> as we all know, the recognition of useful and harmful plants has been going with the civilization for a very, very long period of time. Uh, plants have moved around from one place to another way back thousands of years. When trade started, so plants moved from China, they moved from, the, from, from Mesopotamia or ancient Iraq. They moved from Persia that were taken. Now, this movement of the plants <clears throat> meant that many of the plants lost their original names. Simply, they were adapted to a new culture, <clears throat> new peoples, and over there they were hidden. An analysis of the etymology of the drugs, we were just talking about the distant plants by a Hindu who was a physician, <clears throat> noted that there were 31% which were basically did have the same ancient Mesopotamian link in their names. Later were from Greek, from Persian, India, the basic Arabian Peninsula, and some from Egypt. <clears throat> now, so in this chapter, basically we're exploring the names of only 15 plants that was basically I could trace them back as well. Uh, we are listing the classical Arabic name, this vernacular names which are used in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, and they trace uh, where it was originally and where it came from, and basically outline a bit of the culture and historical context because these are all used to either some <laughs> they're used to the people. So in this uh, table, <clears throat> I've listed the common English name, the classical, the Akkadian name, which is a language spoken or a written language in the Mesopotamia. This appears to be called. It's named in Hebrew, in Syriac, and in the southern Arabian languages, which is the far Masusi and Sir Don. language in the far. And it's the bottom. So, as you can see, some of the differences or some of the similarities that I'm going to take some of the plants which are which have where the name has carried on. For example, look at Ficus, the second one from, uh, from the top. In Akkadian, it's called um, you know, Titu. And that sort of name has been kept. In Hebrew, it is called Taina, Syriac, Teta. In uh, Saudi Arabia, language, which is very similar to the common or the normal or the modern uh, Arabic theme. So they, they, that has somehow stayed on from 
give back several thousand years to the present. I'd like to also take an example of Olia, which was in Akkadian called Zerdu. In, uh, in, in other languages, Zaid or Zaidka, but in Ari or the Southern Arabian languages, however, it just changed for Muti or Mutai, which are probably not very similar to Zaid or Zaidu. Uh, <clears throat> some more examples are on the here. Over here. Uh, and uh, I will, because I'm not going to talk about Phoenix, which is uh, the date bomb. Uh, for, for this, uh, the first is the Akkadian uh, languages, uh, in which, which is quite different from what we use today. But then again, because Phoenix uh, Dactylipal or the date palm is so widely distributed that every different part of the world kind of has its own influence and we use a different name. Tamar or Nahal is a very common name, which is in Arabic. When you come to um, the Syriac names, it's Tamrata or Dakila. Uh, when you come actually to the uh, Bavari names, they are quite different from uh, Nahal or, or Tamar. Okay, we can. Sorry? Close to me. Okay. So uh, I just want to show a small clip movie which I did about a couple of weeks ago in the park. <clears throat> and that, if you uh, just put it on, please. Yeah, <laughs> 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 It's only a short one. But the idea is for me to show this uh, little kid was basically that uh, a who is uh, wearing a cap and the person sitting across him is his mother. He didn't obviously want to be photographed. Uh, so we had to, I had to take a photograph of, of uh, a video with her back to us. Now, the thing that I wanted to show in this is that they're taking, they're talking about Shema. <laughs> it is a language that, of course, I do not understand. That Saeed is translating it into, uh, into English, actually. What they're actually talking about over here is, a, is, a, is an endemic tree called Enochrysis, which is found in the common over there. And it has been used extensively. In fact, I bought uh, some parts of uh, leaves from the market in, uh, in Salal. This I have read about uh, uh, this plant, Sampa. <laughs> but what about she, she's saying over here that it is used for the thumb, and people go out of the jungle and they pull down the like uh, pull down the trees, and they will eat it there and then to relieve uh, abdominal problems. This is something that you cannot try. You, it's not written in in, in, in many of the books. It is all the knowledge that she possesses, and that knowledge is in the language that she talks in, which is Shanghai. If that language is lost, we will lose a very important part of a useful part for something which is linked very, very strongly to its medicinal use. And that is, the, that is one of the emphasis of, of the book, as well as my chapter over here, is that. You can take a plant, you can cultivate it anywhere in the world, but the historical and the cultural link that it has, that is always lost. And if you lose the language, that link is again lost. And to lose the link on a cultural context for a plant renders it almost like an exotic ornamental or something which 
can be used medicinally, but it doesn't have the historical you know, context to it. So you look at losing a little bit of, in a way, a heritage that you should be linked to the land. Uh, because I don't have a lot of time, I will go very quickly, uh, which is allopiviruses, again, an endemic plant. We can just go forward. And uh, <clears throat> so its mother talked about two plants. One was Kluf, which was this plant, and endemic to Yemen and to uh, the farm, basically, from which we removed the resin. And that resin is. Um, Stored, it's dried and stored in small little pouches and used whenever it's used. Aloe vera, though, we all know aloe vera. She said sickle is the name for aloe vera, which is used for we don't use aloe vera because that makes your face black. If you want to use it for better purposes, use aloe vera. So, again, there's a difference here in which they have this knowledge and they use the word thread or cloak. Ficus, I will talk too much about it because we all know about ficus. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Uh, Olia, again, uh, an extremely old uh, plant which has been cultivated for almost about 10,000 years. Uh, <clears throat> um, it has been known in Mesopotamia. And because in Mesopotamia, uh, there isn't an Akkadian word. So the word Sirvu, which is, it's not absolutely clear whether it was always used for uh, 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 olive or not. And because it doesn't go there, it's not that direct connection. Although it has been used in Mesopotamia or ancient Mesopotamia since a you know, long time. Okay. Carry on. Uh, it's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll finish over there. Uh, most of this information is in the book. So <laughs> and I'm sorry uh, of my uh, throat problem of my ear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shahina. So now I'm in my friends. Because the, the, the last of the, the, the three talks, yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about concepts, two concepts which occur within chapters in the book, um, names before numbers and the language of wind. So these two topics illustrate aspects of the human nature relationship in the region. Um, so we're going to look briefly at the human nature relationship and then look at these topics in turn. So indigenous languages reflect the close relationship between people and their natural environment. And that's one of the things that we stress within the book. And regions of the world inhabited by people have the greatest, um, ten, with the greatest biodiversity, exhibit the greatest linguistic diversity. And Oman is indeed the most linguistically diverse state within the Arabian Peninsula. If we go on to the next slide, um, you can see here we we have chapters dealing with Qatar in the north, and then round the Sundan Peninsula, the Far, Socotra, and Yemen. And what does what does this area have in common? We're dealing with the richest state on earth and we're dealing with one of the poorest in Yemen. But what they have in common is the proximity to the sea and the proximity to the winds um, and in, in certain areas to the monsoon, the need to gain uh, the need to, to gain life from the sea and from and from the land. Um, names before numbers um, Miranda Morris wrote a very nice chapter within the book, What's in a Name? And this is a topic that I've thought about for some time, that names, names are often replacing what we would use for terms for which we would use numerical, uh, numerical expressions, dating through climatic events, 
times of day and periods of time. When we're talking, when talking about how old someone is, someone will ask me how old I am, and I simply tell them that I was born snip of an age or older of an age, 1959. Well, they then have to start working stuff out. And people will often judge their birth, if they were born before 1970, by the occurrence of a particular climatic event. So it became, which was 1947, the year when all cows died, the year when there was only um, bare corn stalks in the, in the region of Double Hummer. Um, and through that, we're able to judge the ages of people. So Abdullah, my very good friend Abdullah, his mother, we worked out, was born in during Sinit of Arkeyev, and in fact, she was born during the month of the drowning, the year of the drowning, and so was I. So we worked out that there's sort of twins. Um, <laughs> times of day. This is the area of the culture which I find one of the, which I find particularly difficult to adjust to if I want to meet someone, and they will say, Oh, we'll meet the well labor. The old one is when the sun is, if you're in the morning, when the sun is parallel with your eyes, and the way I and is a little bit before then. I find that quite difficult. And the concept of Kalaini as well. We worked out there are about 27 different terms, four times a day, based on the position of the sun and based on the degree of darkness, with diminutives being used or when the sun is slightly lower in the sky. So we have the old one, when the sun is in front of my eye, the way I live and it's just before that. We have Kalaini, the time when the camels will return to the homestead, and Kalaani, a little bit later, when the sun is lower in the sky. But not a question of earlier later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And periods of time, I could talk about that. Periods of time, judge from the amount of time it would take someone to do a traditional task. So I will come to you in the time it would take to milk 10 camels. I will come to you in the time it would take to walk two bends in the body. The language of wind, I could have taken all sorts of concepts. I could have taken water, as shown by Gasparini and Al Mahri in their chapter, weather in general, as shown by Al Ghanim. And in her chapter on weather in, in Qatar. But I chose wind, partly because Rosa contacted me a week before I went to Oman last time in January and said she would like to do a collaborative project, film project on wind. And I thought, actually, I quite like wind. Um, as a cyclist, I like wind and I hate wind. It depends on which direction it's going. Um, and while I was there, I realized how much, I realized why the language is changing. And it's because people now live in houses, they live between four walls and they have a roof on their head. So wind has less importance. It doesn't matter whether the village from the night is really cold and really strong. It doesn't matter whether indeed has lots of moisture in it or less, less moisture. Um, because you don't feel it. And I sort of realized that I don't try in Britain. I drive in Oman. I cycle in Britain. And when I, when I drive, I don't know how fast I'm going. I only know how fast I'm going from looking at the dial and from my eyes, from seeing. I can't feel. When I'm on my bike, I can feel exactly how fast I'm going. I can feel where the wind is coming from, how strong the wind is. I know. And there's a loss. Shahida talked about loss. There's a lot of a sense of loss. Um, actually, if you go on to the next slide, we'll have something about the lexical complexity, and I'm not going to read you through. But basically, in the left-hand column, you have different terms for, for wind in memory. Um, so depending on where it comes from, um, depending on the heat of the wind. So we're here, and khurub basically come from the same direction, but khurub is, is always, is always really. 
Um, and then you've got some more nuances on the on the right hand side, transits, dry winds, a pretty cold easterly wind and post monsoon period with a deep cold, a, a cool sea breeze, spillage, muddy, a strong cold desert wind. Now you'll notice when you just quickly look through this that um, the translation either has wind or breeze and an attribute, but we have all these different terms and more, several more, as Rosa and I have been finding we've been going through the videos today. Um, and wind comes into the poetry. I've shown very nicely in the chapter by Alvarez Liam Chinti and the new cover, particularly in deep. And it was actually only this time that I realized when I was over there that in deep the sea breeze is not always much. It depends on the time of year when it comes. It's loved at the end of the hot period and it's loved at the beginning of the post monsoon period when it gets rid of the flies, the panels. But it's got a bad element as well. And the winds have got personalities. Um, there are stories in the wind as well. Um, in another paper, not in, not in this book, that talks about Gargat Lagoots in Qatar, the blow of the old woman, comes at the end of March. Towards the, towards the end of March, when you think that the, that the cold winter wind is gone, this old woman shaved all her sheep, sheared all her sheep, and then they died because there was a blast. Um, if we go on to the next one, this is a video, and this is in, this was recorded during the wind building um, uh, building session. But um, Sahel is here showing us how to point to a rain cloud. Okay, that, so that's the lovely, um, that's, that's the lovely cloud. It's funny what different, in different circumstances, different aspects of weather look beautiful. Uh, no, seriously, can I not say a poem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, but if you point, if you point to a rain cloud, you have to do that. If you point like that, it will go away. Yeah. And I just want to say this little poem, because although I've been working in Oman for the past, well, since 2000, end of 2009, my heart's really in Yemen, and there is a chapter on Yemen, um, and we were talking about loss, and this is about loss, so if you will indulge me. The Sana'a, not touching, but brushing so gently reality. I left my heart in Sana'a. I slip in and out in my dreams and in my waking, touching, yet not touching my heart. Did I tell you the day I walked through the old city, wearing to come up, shading, hazing, concealing, now revealing, blurring, brushing the truth, reality, as I slipped through the city, dust then, dimly disguised, through a city etched in the earth, centuries old skyscrapers, stone, Baked brick, lime plastered windows, the gamaria blue windows, jealously holding back the light, like my veil. I have mist in my eyes now. Years later, they're blurring, now revealing, and true blurring, not touching, but brushing so gently. 